ready when you are. Hello, um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is a webinar being organised by Waste Aid. My name is Zoe Lenkovich. I am Senior Technical Advisor and Head of Communications at Waste Aid. We are an international NGO focused on sharing waste management and recycling skills around the world. Um, we've organised this webinar uh, today um, in preparation for COP26, which is, as you know, taking place in Glasgow. Um, E-waste, what is electronic waste? Well, waste, electronic and electrical equipment, also known as e-waste, is one of the world's most damaging and least recycled waste streams. It's actually the fastest growing waste stream in the world. Um, globally, an estimated 50 million tonnes of e-waste is generated each year, and 80% of that is going straight to landfills and dump sites around the world. So if we want to, um, to be able to have metals, precious metals available for the low carbon technology of the future in the context of COP26, we really need to start recycling e-waste at a much higher rate than we're managing at the moment. So that's the context for this webinar. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing our panelists. Um, they are Steve Oliver, the Chief Executive and Founder of Music Magpie, a re-commerce company operating in the UK and US, enabling electrical goods to be repaired, resold and recycled. Uh, Music Magpie have sponsored this event and they've also sponsored WasteAid's e-waste hub, which you can find at wasteaid.org forward slash e-waste. Um, our second guest is Retta Hora, Head of Sustainability at the WE Centre and Circular Innovation Hub in Nairobi, Kenya. And our third and final panellist is Adam Minter, Bloomberg opinion columnist and the author of Junkyard Planet, Travels in a Billion Dollar Trash Trade, and Secondhand, Travels in the New Global Garage Sale. Um, Adam is joining us from the States, uh, th well, th this morning in the States, so thank you very much to you all for being here. I'm really excited to be speaking with you. Um, so first of all, could I ask you each um, in turn to give just a five-minute introduction to yourself, your work, um, within the context of e-waste recycling for um, a low-carbon future? Um, Steve, could we start with you, please? Uh, certainly. Hi, Zoe. Um, thanks for your introduction uh, of me and the panel. I don't think I've ever been on such a global panel, by the way, covering uh, such a wide span of the uh, of certainly the, the time uh, difference between the three of us. So uh, a very convenient lunchtime slot for me. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, yeah, Zoe, as you say, I'm the co-founder and uh, group chief executive of Music Magpie. Um, hopefully a number of the uh, listeners will have heard of the brand and, and kind of know what we do. Um, we aim to be the smart, sustainable and trusted way for people to buy and rent and sell to the business. And I perhaps think we, we're going to talk more, uh, you know, when it's relevant to Music Magpie about people selling to Music Magpie. So I started the business 14 years ago in my garage in Stockport. Um, and actually, as the name suggests, Music Magpie, we started in CDs, DVDs and games, uh, but really providing what I still call to this day a lazy man's eBay service. And what do I mean when I say that? It's just a fast, easy, convenient, trusted, hassle-free way of selling and decluttering your old product. So we provide a fixed valuation, obviously unlike eBay where you're not sure where you're going to, what you're going to get it for. Uh, we provide free logistics and we pay for product when it arrives in our warehouse. What do we do with all that product? We thoroughly refurbish it. Uh, put it in as good as new condition. In the case of consumer technology products, which obviously we're going to talk about a lot today, uh, we put a 12 month warranty on and resell it back to consumers. We have the UK business, which is branded Music Magpie. We have our US brand uh, called Declutter, which is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we couldn't call it Music Magpie because the Americans didn't know what a magpie was, as Adam might tell us. Uh, and they, they thought our little cartoon magpie was a penguin. Uh, so we called it a few years ago, we rebranded it to Declutter. And really that's again what we're aiming to do for the consumer. So what have we done over the years with all those products, whether it was our legacy category of physical media, so CDs, DVDs, books and games, and now books. Well, actually what we're doing is again, we're refurbishing and reselling those across the Amazon and the eBay platforms. 
but now more in recent years on our own sales channels. So Music Magpie both does the selling and the buying directly with the consumer. But on Amazon and eBay, um, I should just uh, say for completeness, we're the world's biggest reseller. So we've built a fantastic relationship with tens of millions of consumers uh, by becoming the world's biggest reseller on Amazon and eBay. I guess just to finish off for, for my introduction, we are now the UK's biggest mobile phone recycler. We've really pivoted the business. So two thirds of our turnover now comes from recycling of consumer tech products. That's led by mobile phones, but is also tablets, games, consoles, wearables, um, which one have it? MacBooks uh, and a, a whole range of other um, consumer electronics products. Exactly the same principles of people selling to us, getting cash for, for it, encouraging them, and we're going to talk about that a lot today, encouraging them to empty their drawers uh, and do something that's our strap line, smart for you and smart for the planet. And obviously the business for, throughout its 14 years has been 99% uh, of our turnover is from recycling activities, but it's only really in the last two, three, four years that really that message has totally resonated with both consumers and I have to say also uh, the investor base. And it was that investor base that and the rate uh, uh, increased awareness that, that, that's arisen so much in the last two or three years that really helped us uh, float the business in April of this year on the London Stock Exchange. So um, that's, that's an overview uh, of the business. And obviously we're gonna talk a lot today about the consumer tech uh, side of the business and how we're trying to encourage consumers to recycle their old product. Fabulous, thanks so much, Steve. And really interesting and reassuring as well to hear that there's that, that you've really noticed that growing awareness over the last Absolutely. couple of years. Yeah, looking forward to hearing more about that then. Thank you. Um, Retta, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, hi, hi everyone. Good evening from this side of the world, from Nairobi. My name is Rita Mora, and I'm, as you've heard, head of sustainability, we center and the circular innovation hub. What the WE Center basically does is collect e-waste from across the country. We're actually the only licensed recycler who collects every type of waste without um, discriminating what exactly it is that we, we collect. And then we take it to our center for recycling. So recycling basically entails um, disassembling this equipment, just the opposite of what the manufacturers do when they make the glamorous electronics. We just now come in beautifully, just set them apart to get different fractions from them and the different fractions are then recycled. Some are recycled internally within our operations. There are some that we have to extend to more, uh, to our partners to, to recycle because they are specific in those uh, areas. Then with the Circular Innovation Hub, it's just literally like a wing or a baby of the WE Center. We just realized that some of the problems we face within the, uh, the operations that we were having is that some of our clients would ask for like extra, um, extra services, which we wouldn't be able to carry out as a waste recycling company. Yeah, so we had to be able to now give more, give more value. That is by carrying out research, um, inviting innovators to the space, such that they are able to give solutions to some of the US problems that we would also like to solve. But they help us. So that is why we have the innovation hub to encourage young people to be a part of this journey that we're having, and to ensure that people integrate circularity into their processes, all the way from design to um, disposal. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about the work that you do both at the WE Centre and the Circular Innovation Hub. Um, it's going to be fascinating uh, to have this discussion. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, yeah, finally, then I will pass over to Adam Minta. Very glad that you could join us. Um, it was touch and go for a minute there. We thought that you were going to have to dash off after some breaking news. But so much for being here. And um, yeah. please introduce yourself. Thanks, Zoe. And I'm thrilled to be here. I'm a big admirer of what uh, Waste Aid does. I, I think of myself as, as one of your biggest fans. So it's, it's really, uh, really exciting for me to be part of the seminar. Um, I am a writer and author. Uh, I write columns for Bloomberg Opinion and I write books uh, for myself and, and my readers. Um, I cover a lot of topics, but for years, my, one of my main focuses, primary focus has been waste and recycling. Uh, that's no accident. I come from a immigrant family of scrap peddlers in the United States. Uh, when my people arrived in the United States in the early 20th century, no education, no skills, 
um, really no idea what they were going to do. So they became waste pickers on the streets of Galveston, Texas. And that small business that they started, literally putting rags into their backpacks, uh, became a small family metal business. Um, and I grew up in that. And some of my earliest memories are walking through the family metal warehouse. I think people who don't know the industry would call it a junk warehouse. Um, and very early on, what I learned, um, in fact, some of my earliest memories are being told this stuff has value. It may look like junk to other people, but it has value. Um, and so that's how I grew up um, around what others consider junk. And I was told we need to find value in. Um, eventually, I grew up and out of the business for reasons you can find in uh, my first book. Um, but suffice to say, um, I love the recycling business, but I'm, I'm not a particularly good businessman. I'm a much better writer. <laughs> and so uh, I became a documenter of the industry. And it's really been one of my goals over the years to sort of disrupt some of the damaging myths about people who do this business, um, that they are engaged on the e-way side and just burning things and throwing it away. And it's, it's a really bad depiction. Sometimes it's a very racist depiction of people who do this kind of work. I spent 12 years in China um, trying to disrupt some of the myths around e-waste recycling there. Certainly it's not done in China or in, uh, in other parts of Africa where I have spent time, always to the, way, it, to the degree and to the safety standards that we might want in the United States or Europe, but it's done and it's not done in ways that are described as primitive. It's done in ways that preserve value and pres you know, uh, support livings, allow technology to go uh, and be used by people who might not have access to it at full retail price. And ultimately something I've realized over the years, even uh, it has, tremendous um, environmental benefits. You know, we tend to think of these things in terms of resources saved and that's true. But a few years ago, uh, it sort of ch I sort of changed my mind on some of this as we were thinking about um, carbon and Apple started putting out uh, reports of how much carbon intensity is involved in manufacturing and the life cycles of its products. And one of the things they showed was that more than 80% of the carbon emitted in the life of an iPhone uh, is uh, emitted during the manufacture. And it occurred to me that we are doing a really tremendous thing in this industry because I still consider myself part of the industry. I write about it, I'm, but I'm a recycling journalist and, and you know, the people who are in this business because I grew up in this business are my brothers and sisters. Um, you know, we're saving carbon, you know, we're preventing carbon from being emitted. And that comes back to what the whole goal of COP26 is. And if we can recycle these things, and even better, if we can reuse these devices, and if we can't reuse the device, let's reuse components of these devices, because that's all about carbon. And so uh, a lot of my writing over the last couple of years is really focused on that, and how uh, different components of the uh, recycling and reuse industry are able to really boost um, our efforts at carbon by reusing and recycling these devices. So I'm excited uh, to be part of this discussion. Uh, Retha, I, as I mentioned to you before the call started, I actually visited the WE Center. I'm pretty sure now as I was thinking through this, it was in 2015 and I really admire what you're doing in Kenya. I think it's so important and I'd love to hear more. Fabulous, thanks very much, Adam. Um, so, you know, listeners, um, I hope you can see that we've put together a superb panel and um, with very, very varied experience. Um, and we're going to have a really interesting discussion here today. So um, I think let's let's just start off then. Um, I'm going to ask Steve, first of all, what do you think the public understanding about e-waste is? And what approaches do you use to encourage people to actually recycle their electronics? Well, I think as a base point, actually, I mean, I think it, it is improving and we've seen some stats just in the last couple of days, actually, about people's awareness of e-waste. We were staggered to find out when we started looking into this, uh, you know, properly uh, and that, you know, less than one in five people even knew what e-waste was. You know, you often get the, it's obvious, it's one of those that's terribly obvious when you get told the answer, what does e-waste stand for? Well, it's electronic waste. Um, and, you know, even less people than that then know what they should and could be doing with it. And I think, you know, it is down to all of us and, and, and Waste Aid is a wonderful organisation to help that education process of what it is and the damage that it's doing and just the size of problem that it is. You know, you quoted the, the 50 million tonnes uh, figure previously. Now, the UK is the worst, second worst, I think, globally contributor to that per capita. 
So, you know, we did our, our uh, consumer awareness campaign recently uh, with Mount Recycle Mall that we took down to the G7 summit in Cornwall um, in June to do just that, to raise awareness of the biggest single challenge Magpie has. Our biggest competitor isn't another named website. It's people's apathy in doing nothing with their old e-waste. And it's encouraging them to not leave it in that drawer, not leave it in a box under the stairs or in the cloakroom. It's to do something meaningful. And actually also now corporate bodies who were encouraging again to do something that I'll use the phrase again, smart for them and smart for the planet. You know, we did a, uh, a study finding out that there's 16 billion pounds within the UK alone of old e-waste in, in drawers. You know, we have on average 11 devices. I we had a problem with our electrics in our house a couple of weeks ago and I went in the electric cupboard and found four old mobile phones and I was like oh no even I'm doing it um but I blame the wife and, and my daughters of course um but I think it is just that people's apathy of doing nothing oh I'll keep it as a spare or I might need it one day and and before you know it it's obsolete and it you know it is ultimately ending up in landfill and as we all know sure all of us on this panel and what the message that we're getting across is there's some incredibly valuable stuff in that old you know consumer technology product there's also some really damaging stuff you know there's lead there's mercury there's you know even arsenic which is if it ends up in landfill is poisoning the soil so i think it's just encouraging consumers and and raising their awareness of you need to do something about this please don't add to the problem uh, but do something constructive with your old product Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. And I think that, you know, in the UK, if people throw their electronics into the bin, then it's going to go to a landfill or an incinerator. Um, whereas in Kenya, Rita, um, you know, you can tell us what happens to the e-waste that people throw away there and what, what kind of attitudes do you encounter when you talk to people about it? Yeah, yes. Uh, there's an interesting question, first of all, that you, you asked Steve about um, what people think e-waste is. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I just wanted to share a funny story about a, a one time that somebody asked us about e-waste and then we asked them, what do you think e-waste stands for? And they just told us, oh, is it is it internet waste? And we're like, wow, <laughs> it's interesting how many different explanations people have for as long as they don't understand or somebody does not explain to them. But um, we've done our fair share of advertising um, what e-waste is and how to properly manage it. So, so far what we, we have been able to do is we collect e-waste from people's homes and offices and governments, international um, companies and every single person who has e-waste wherever they are. But they also have an option of dropping it at our centers. We have over 30 collection points across the country. And we also partnered with supermarkets and telecommunication companies to be able to collect the waste in different counties. And we also have the government office, several government offices across the country as well for people to be able to work there and drop whatever items they have. Um, furthermore, you realize that as much as we target corporates having the biggest amount of waste ideally and governments, there's also a lot of individuals or people in households who have a lot of this waste. And in the first place, the people working in those offices have homes. So it means we have to educate people from their houses that this is e-waste, this is the right way to dispose of it, and we have the right solution for you. So what when once we realized that was one of the um, hitches that we had, we decided now we will be running um, estate drives. So this is whereby we just um, every Saturday or every once and then on Saturdays, we go to communities to teach them what e-waste is. We just send out a poster maybe a week before and tell them, hey, you guys will be here in two weeks time so that they can gather up whatever stuff they would like to dispose and then also run um, repair camps such that when you come and dispose your waste and ask us questions about e-waste, we give you information and we also diagnose whatever ICT equipment you have so that now you can go repair them or you can bring them to our center for repairs because we also refurbish um, the waste. Um, yeah, I hope I have answered the questions that, that, that you had yeah. asked. Is there anything I've left out? Thank you. No, that's, that's super. Um, Adam, did you want to come in there? I did. I did. Um, you know, as a working journalist, uh, 
um, you know, I, I sort of have two audiences, both my editors and uh, my audience, my readers. And, and one thing that I found very early on, I mean, as early as 20 years ago, when you ask people what happens to e-waste um, in the United States and, and also uh, Europe, though I'm, I'm not as familiar with my European audience, is to say, well, of course, you know, it's collected and then it's dumped in developing countries. Um, and that's a very, very common um, uh, belief. Um, from a uh, recycling and reuse standpoint, it's a really damaging a belief because what it tends to do is it tends to get people who have reusable devices um, to not send them out for recycling. So here in the United States, a very affluent country, um, you know, a three or four year old iPhone can often be called e-waste. You know, uh, because people upgrade very quickly here, they can they can afford to upgrade very quickly here. Well, as you know, as Reda knows, a three or four year old iPhone uh, is not e waste. I mean, in uh, in in Kenya, there's there's real demand for that. But when you have uh, when you have people in the United States fearing, oh, it's going to be sent to Agbogbloshi in Ghana, and someone's going to set fire to it, then they don't want to drop it off then they don't want to do anything with it. There's this fear, and it's, it's also a very racially based fear that people in Africa or people in Asia are going to set fire to this. It's very primitive modes of recycling, and, and it's incredibly damaging. Uh, again, it at, a, at, at minimum, it means that the stuff stays in drawers and it doesn't circulate. Um, you know, the idea of e-waste export, and you know, it's, it's a tough term, e-waste, because it's got baked into it the term waste. You know, um, yeah. in the U.S., we're trying to use the term e-scrap, but even I'm not crazy about that. I just like reusables because a 10 year old iPhone has reusable components in it. You know, the screens, the memory, whatever it is, you know, if, if it goes to a place where people are in the habit of doing it and they have the economic incentive of doing it, that stuff will be reused. But I, I really do believe for the industry as a whole, I mean, we almost want to stop using that term e-waste because it immediately sh keeps things in drawers or it, it shifts them into uh, the wrong sort of shoot uh, where stuff is, is wasted. And, and really there's so much value in this. And, and a lot of my work has just been focused on, on on reframing this discussion so that we're not asking what is what is this e-waste is what is the value in this object that the original owner doesn't want anymore and usually there's a lot of value and maybe that value needs to be recovered via export to Kenya you know that might and and it will be you know and it can be done I mean the we center uh, you know if I send them if I send with a, a four-year-old iPhone she's not going to do anything with it other than find a new user for it because it's perfectly good and it'll be high demand in Kenya you know, so to me, um, that's sort of, that's a real challenge. It's a marketing challenge. It's a journalist challenge because I blame a lot of journalism, um, not bad journalism, but just very narrowly focused exploitative journalism uh, for fostering this misunderstanding of the value in these objects. Interesting, thank you. Um, Steve, do you, when, when people send their items into Music Magpie then, are they, you know, do you find that much of it is repairable, reusable, or, you know, what, what percentage has to go to dismantling and recycling? Yeah, we ask um, consumers when selling to us to grade the product themselves, so basically good, poor, or faulty, uh, because actually we don't want to discourage people from selling us their faulty items. Um, you know, we have got the ability to repair. We've got in-house technicians. We've got over 50 technicians who just specialize in mobile phone. Because actually, if you think of the reason why most consumers have finished with that product, I think Adam touched on this now, it may only be three or four years old. It's more than likely, very often, the battery. It's just they've got fed up of the battery life that doesn't last very long. They get frustrated about, oh, it's time for a new one. And that average time with a phone has crept up to about three or four years as battery life has improved. But actually, a battery replacement is one of the more simple repairs we can do to a phone. It may be the screen that's cracked or broken. It may be another element of the phone. But a bit, I guess a bit like an authorised car dealer, we do that 70-point quality check because obviously in reselling it back to a consumer, it's absolutely imperative that we've made sure that we are reselling as good as new conditions. So, and that can be a broken item. It can be something that doesn't power on. The only thing we need them to do in terms of an iPhone, as an example, is sign out of their iCloud because we don't know their password uh, and we don't want to know their password. Um, so, um, you know, as long as they are signed out of an iCloud, that we can do something meaningful with that product. We resell over 95% of the close to half a million consumer tech items uh, that we buy. 
And we're really proud of that. What do we do with the other 5%? We harvest them for parts. If we can't make it, we, we take as many parts as we can and, and use them in other repairs. If there is literally a handful of bits and pieces left at the end of that, of course, we responsibly uh, recycle them. So really, we are very, very focused on giving them, and it was my own chairman who said to me, don't, don't keep calling it Second Life, Steve, because actually what we're doing now, we've got our new monthly subscription rental scheme. We're giving things third lives, fourth lives, fifth lives, by really, truly getting customers into that circular economy ecosystem, where they can rent an item from us, they can buy it from us, they can sell it back, and obviously we can get them into that. And, you know, we, it's fascinating. The attitude to refurbished product has changed so much over the last few years. You know, it used to be, dare I say, even the phrase secondhand was a bit niche. It was a bit grubby. Now it's mainstream. And actually, it's not just mainstream. It's smart and it's savvy because people know they can save some money and do something that's really smart. So, you know, when we ask people now, would you consider buying a refurbished phone? Over half people say yes. A few years ago, that would have been 10 or 20%. So it's really changing the attitude, but we're very, very focused on giving all as much product as we can at that set in life. It's so imperative. Yeah, that's really, I'm, I'm amazed actually that, it's, that you're repairing and refurbishing 95%. I really thought that a lot more of that would be going, uh, you know, into, into dismantling and recycling. So that's, um, that's really surprised me actually. Um, Retta, do you find that similar levels with the, with the, with the e-waste that you collect? Is most of it repairable? And is there, is there a similar sort of market for refurbished items? Um, yeah, definitely, because most of the items that we collect um, usually have either parts or could potentially have parts that are still working. So I'll explain it in two ways, what the market looks like. We have upstream and downstream sort of like markets. So the upstream market is whereby people dispose the waste with a recycling company, right? So it's only from um, either business to recycling or individual to recycling company. Then downstream, this is where now we have refurbished equipment that are going out into the market. We have spare parts that are going into the market and we also have e-waste fractions that are going into the market. Um, the refurbished items is usually ICTs, that is the printers and the computers of which definitely we have to make sure we take care of data. We have to make sure that it's properly wiped out even if the owner of that has already wiped up the data just to do it the second time and to have a report from our end that it is done. Then the second one is um, on now selling the fractions. This is where by now we have things such as if we have copper that we have extracted from the material, then it's good enough for a market. We have plastic, it's good enough to be reused in something else. So we might as well just sell it out as a downstream. Then we have now the third one, which I said now, are fractions. So these are fractions that we don't necessarily take care of them in the country because we still have some that we have to export such that they are properly recycled there because of the lack of technology that we have here. So I'll give an example with batteries. We have specific types of batteries such as lithium ion that we upcycle to make new solar batteries in the country. But we have others such as the cadmium batteries, which we cannot really do much about. So we have to export them and extend that issue to another recycler who is more advanced in technology when it comes to dealing with such kind of batteries. Because we follow an um, zero, zero dumping policy, which means every single thing that we collect or receive we have to make sure we find a solution for it. There is no, uh, there is no way out of it. That is why we also form a lot of partnerships to be able to um, have other people take care of things that we are unable to take care of internally or within our country. <coughs> then, mm -hmm. yeah, please continue. No, I just wanted wanted to know if I've I've seen a question that was posed. I wanted to know if we wait to answer towards the end or I can it's fine it if you think that now's a good moment please please do go ahead oh okay it's, it's basically just about policy in kenya the person david i believe has asked do we have a national e-waste management in kenya um if you mind sharing on policy perhaps i can if there's documents you'd like me to check and share the links later on but for now um briefly we do have a draft uh, sustainable waste management 
policy and bill which was still being worked on it is generally for all types of waste but e-waste is a part of it so once it is passed into law we'll be able to have things like the pros that will be working with uh, recyclers and governments together with uh, disposers and manufacturers such that everyone who is producing i um electronics makes sure that they take care of the end of life of that electronic so that is what is entailed in that and also other aspects of how to do the collection how how to do the transboundary if there should be any how to do investment in the same and so on and so forth yeah okay great thanks Rita and just um, in case anybody's not familiar PRO is producer responsibility organization <laughs> right Oh so God, these yeah, are the companies yeah. that, are, that these are the companies that are making it, and like and um, we have these extended producer responsibility systems being set up in various countries now, which which try to um to yeah collect a fee from companies that put these you know ultimately polluting um you know a waste you know the waste into the market. Um, obviously it's not waste when it's put into the market, but um they they pay a fee to help cover the recovery of that material once it becomes a waste um yeah. so it's it's good to hear that, that that's being considered now in kenya as well through policy that's great um adam do you do you see much change in sort of global policy to support e-waste recycling you muted yes sorry okay now i'm good um i do um not all of the shift in policy i would say is good um i you know, from my from my perspective, um, the most important part of e-waste policy is how do we define waste and who gets to define the waste. Um, and I fear and I believe that too often um, the person or the entities defining waste are affluent countries, bureaucrats in affluent countries who are not actually directly dealing with the waste. And in my opinion, uh, the person who should be de you know, defining what is waste is the person who can repair and reuse it. Um, and that is not often a bureaucrat um, working with a PRO or an EPR as we call it over here. Um, you know, it's, it's really going to be say the repair technician in Reta's operation who's saying, okay, well, somebody in Minnesota couldn't fix this phone, but we have the skills and, and the skills of, of, of uh, Kenyan uh, repair techs are unbelievable. I, I don't know if Reza knows this, but at least in North America, I have heard more people talk about the skills of Mombasa techs. They're the best in the world. Nobody can fix things like folks in Mombasa. So that's a whole different topic, but anyway, but I'd love to talk to you about it. But you know, somebody in Mombasa is almost certainly going to have the ability to fix something uh, you know, that somebody in Minneapolis isn't. And so I, I would like to see um, the discussion of e-waste shift to those end markets and those end users and those end repair tax. Um, that's how we should be defining waste. It shouldn't be defined by the rich person, the rich country, the rich entity who says, oh, I can't use this so nobody else can. Um, and I fear that a lot of the policy being made these days is really being made um, from that perspective. And, and sort of circle back to COP26, I mean, you know, ultimately, that's not a good decision for the climate. That's not a good decision if you care about carbon emissions because ultimately nothing is better for consumption than if you keep reusing those products as long as possible. So if you wanna reuse the products as long as possible, ask the repair tech who can fix it, whether or not it's waste and you'll probably have more carbon savings because of it. So um, I would like to see policy shift in that direction and I fear it isn't. Mm, interesting, Steve, what do you have to say to that? Yeah, I think, um... You know, certainly the government and, and policymakers can play a big part in, in what we're all trying to do here. Um, you know, I think the whole right to repair movement uh, that, you know, is, is such a topical uh, uh, area for, for, for any manufacturer to have that responsibility. I do feel, you know, something we're trying to do here at Magpie, we're calling it Magpie Circular and, and the clues in the name in terms of actually providing any brand or retailer starting with tech products and consumer tech products, anything with a plug, um, to provide the ability to buy back the old product when selling the new product. Now, actually, there's two elements to that. There's a really strong ESG statement in that and a very responsible element to that of, we, we will actually deal with the waste for you uh, to the consumer. So take it out of their hands and you know they won't then ultimately allow that product to drift, and I'll use that word drift over maybe some time, um, into landfill. 
but also that's hopefully a really attractive commercial proposition that the brand or retailer can then turn that into, where actually they're then controlling the secondary market. They can offer the consumer a discount. So uh, here in the UK, as we know, you know, it, for a while now, you know, electrical retailers, so big white goods have said, we will charge you to come and take your old one away. I don't think that's good enough, um, actually, because what we know is while some of them are broken, and I've got very little commercial value. And of course, there's a logistics charge in that, but you're leaving the problem with the consumer who is, you know, are they going to act responsibly or not? But actually, a lot of that product still has commercial value. So what the brand or retailer can do is be seen to be acting responsibly, be responsible, but also actually create some commercial circular economy out of that in terms of allowing that product to be refurbished and then servicing, you know, a slightly less privileged market who can't afford the new product. So I think anything that the government and policy makers can do to really encourage that circular economy is really, really important. And, they, you know, would it go as far to say, I think there should be a law that says, you know, the, the manufacturer or the seller of a new electrical item has to then know where the life of that product is going to go? Possibly not. But if we can just start at the moment with that education piece of, you know, what to do with it at the end, here is some very clear instructions. You know, we're all now in our digital worlds. We know, you know, a good online retailer will know the name of the customer and what they've bought and the expected life of that product. And if they can communicate with them and say, hey, are you ready to look at changing that product? Um, or, you know, we can refresh or renew it for you. You know, as I say, with our you know rental scheme, that's very much what we're aiming to do. Most people who are now anniversarying with that are upgrading the product. We're bringing the old one back. We're refurbishing it uh, and re-renting it out to another consumer. So if we can really encourage people, and you know, when we did our Mount Recycle More campaign in Cornwall, we tried to stress it wasn't a political, you know, request or big movement. We're not going to be changing ourselves, chaining ourselves to the sand dunes and gluing ourselves to the local roads. It's all about everybody becoming aware of it. And, you know, by making the sculpture that we did with 20,000 pieces of e-waste and uh, making the seven leaders faces, it made a real, real statement. And, you know, one in five Britons, uh, and this is me showing off a bit, so forgive me for a second, but one in five Britons remember seeing that because it was so impactful. It made an impact on people and made them think where it said, actually, oh, I now understand e-waste and I know it, the damage that it can do. So, you know, if we can impose that obligation, I'll call it, onto manufacturers uh, and brands and retailers. And by the way, we don't have to start with electrical waste. I know we're here to talk about electrical waste, but that could be in branded fashion or sportswear or bicycles, or cars or whatever we're talking about. But um, yeah, I think, um, you know, this is, this is a, a job and task for all of us. And I don't think we can be dictated to by government policy. But I think if it can do more and more to encourage that, well, all the better. Can, yeah, I completely agree, Steve. Oh, sorry, go on, Adam. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate what Steve said. Uh, first of all, uh, Mount Recycle More, uh, I loved it, and my six-year-old loved it. Actually, when you did that, we had just been two weeks earlier to Mount Rushmore, and so he really oh, appreciated right. <laughs> uh, Mount Recycle More. Uh, I, I really appreciate what Steve just said, and in terms of the education piece, um, I think that's that's critical. It, no matter which country you're in, and in, in, in what economic level, um, I, the the one piece of the uh, the education piece that I think is really important, though, is that we not think of circular economies as just within certain countries. I think there's a tendency uh, recently to say, okay, we're going to have a circular economy just in the United States, and it's going to circulate through the United States. States. Circular economies must be global. Um, you know, these are global issues. And insofar as we're telling folks, say, in Europe, oh, we're going to have an EU circular economy, um, you're, you're really not helping things. That, that economy is going to uh, comprise Kenya. You know, it's going to comprise China and you cannot wall it off. I mean, uh, there is sort of a tendency to uh, an anti-globalization tendency in some of this thinking and globalization is real. Um, it's not going away. And, and the environmental problems we have, especially climate change is a global issue. You cannot solve it just within the EU or just with the United States. Circular economies must be global. 
Absolutely. And I think that that really comes through in your book as well, Adam, which are really interesting reads and very enlightening. Um, you know, we, we do live very much in a globalised economy and yeah, any any efforts to, to think that we can consider circular economy within a, a national borders is just um, pie in the sky, really. It's, it's just very impractical. Um, I think as well, you know, moving towards a circular economy, I mean, a lot of the work that we do at Waste Aid is in, is in engaging groups of uh, from society, let's say, who are, you know, they don't consider themselves to be waste managers, but, um, you know, a circular economy involves all resources and getting those resources, you know, keeping those resources in the loop out of dump sites and so on. Um, but it does take a lot of engagement with these other, other um, sectors to try to, to get, develop a shared understanding of the, the benefits of doing this stuff so that we can get more support and more supportive policies and that kind of thing. Um, Rita, I'm wondering, do, how much do you engage with other stakeholders in Kenya that are, sort of, you know, beyond your, you know, the, the sort of narrow e-waste recycling sector? Ah, yeah, yes. I like what each and every one of you has highlighted on being able to communicate what exactly is going on now and how we can change it and help each and everyone to integrate or be integrated into a new system of circular economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think um, if most of us are pretty aware, um, the circular economy is fairly new to most people, that is. And most of us still have that mentality of I will use and I will dump it and I'll get probably now for electronics, I'll get incentives for it. And while looking at the sector, you realize it's very expensive to give people incentives. It's almost impossible to give incentives and still have a business that is running and providing a solution for that. So um, to be able to raise awareness on these and also to be able to get other people in line with what we are all um, heading towards, which is the 2030 um, achievements for the goals, is that we have joined several groups that um, through which we spread information and through which we lobby to the government on what policies we really need and also to edit the, the, the policies and uh, the bills that are being discussed in the parliament so that they pass through us before they move to the next stages. So one of them is KEPSA, that is the uh, Kenya Private Sector Alliance, that now is the bridging gap between the government and private sector. So through them, we're able to give our input to the government and also advice on uh, us being one of the biggest companies to advise on what exactly it is that the sector needs and what it is that the government can do to support us as a private sector. Then we also have our own um, little group such as IACO, that is the East African, um, uh, East African Communication Organization, whereby we have e-waste working groups, not only for Kenya, but also for other East African countries, whereby we share our problems, and then we try to find solutions for those and raise awareness in those different um, regions, just but to mention a few. But now, now coming back down to Kenya, we also have the Circular Innovation Hub, whereby we are engaging the youth to come to us so that we give them training and then we find mentors for whatever innovations that they come up with because we do not want to end up going back to now saying I buy, I use and I dump. Recycling is usually the last option because it's usually the most expensive option. So what we want to instill in people is before, after you, after you use, before you recycle, there is so many options. So we are challenging the youth and going to them and saying, hey guys, this is a platform, a platform that, that we have for you. We have mentors on board and we have potential investors that can invest in whatever small startups or small innovations that you would like to um, throw out there and show us what else we can do with this kind of waste that we have. Because again, the We Center staff cannot have all the answers to, <laughs> to all the problems that we may be facing. This is why now we are trying to tap into now the youthful minds and engage with them and of course, as people always say, the future is in the hands of the youth. So, yeah. That's fantastic. I was talking last week with Cordy Aziz from the Circular Innovation Hub in Ghana, and we were having yeah. a similar conversation that, you know, with, with waste and recycling, often you can't, it's not a cookie cutter approach. Um, you know, yeah. we don't have all the answers and what works in one country may, or economy may well not work in another. So a lot of that, um, you know, supporting particularly young innovators and entrepreneurs to identify and develop, um, you know, good workable 
business savvy solutions, um, you know, where is, is really key. Um, could you, I'm just really interested, Risa, could you give us some, like an example of what kind of um, innovation these young people are developing, please? Yeah, so we came across several interesting ones. Um, we have uh, one who is making art out of the waste that uh, comes from e-waste. So you find, for example, something like copper, they don't literally have to go to the original market to get copper, but they can get sort of <laughs> secondhand copper um, that has been reused, that has been used in electronics. They can make whatever art and jewelry out of it. Then we also have one interesting one from a gentleman who is um, making mobile, um, mobile Wi-Fi out of you reused parts of e-waste. So you, you find that there's so many ideas that people have which need e-waste as a resource and we have it in plenty. And at the same time, it's a, it's a way of raising awareness such that they also tell other people that, hey, you need to bring back this kind of waste because we get parts from it or because we get this kind of value from it for us to be able to generate a business. And there's also somebody who can help you to recycle it in, in the right way. Brilliant. Really interesting. Adam, have you come across mm -hmm. other, other innovations like that in your travels? Well, when you talk about stakeholders working together, I mean, the one uh, that immediately came to mind um, maybe is a, a little further up the value chain um, is uh, manufacturers and designers of products working with recyclers, um, that they are actually going in and, and, and looking at how their products are recycled. And, and the company that comes to mind, uh, because I've spoken to them about it, is Dell. Um, Dell um, uh, takes some of its product designers uh, to recycling operations so that they can see what happens to the afterlives of their, during the afterlives of their products, how they're broken down, how they're taken apart, how easy, or in many cases, how difficult it is uh, to, to remove uh, to remove batteries or to remove memory modules from these uh, uh, machines. And I think that kind of um, interaction is incredibly important. And, and it has informed, I know at Dell um, in particular, and I'm, I don't work for Dell, I, you know, I have no, no role there. I mean, I, but I know that it's informed um, some of their product design decisions. Um, for example, a few years ago, it, it informed, and this sounds very simple, but just having a very simply removable door so that they can get to the memory modules, you know? And, and they have self-interest for doing this as well, because, um, you know, for their large corporate customers, they maybe deploy 1500 laptops say, um, if they are brought in to replace the memory, they wanna make it easier for their repair techs to do that quickly so they can get on to the next job. But ultimately it makes it easier for the person who buys that, um, that laptop secondhand, whether it be you know, in the UK or Kenya or wherever it is to repair that. And again, the goal being we make this stuff easier to reuse and recycle. And I do believe, and this is you know, something that the right to repair movement has been very good at pushing, is ultimately that's going to require changes on the part of manufacturers to enable these kinds of design changes. And I think the manufacturers are doing it. I think they're starting to find uh, that they have um, a financial incentive to do it, um, in part because uh, uh, you know, consumers want repairable products. And for the consumer, repairable isn't necessarily repairable. It's a durable product. If you're going to spend you know, in the US, $1,000 on a phone, um, you no longer want that phone for 18 months. I mean, the, the, you know, we know this. People are holding onto these devices longer and lo and behold, they're starting to replace the battery. So you want that phone that you can, that you can keep going for cheaper. So I think ultimately a lot of this focus has to go to the manufacturers as well. Right, yeah, I think if we're seeing it as an investment, obviously we do want to be able to, to um, maintain the integrity of our products and so on and um, to, to extend their life. I mean, Steve, without asking you to name any names in particular, like, do you find, you know, with goods that you're sent that need repairing, are some, you know, do some manufacturers make much more easily to repair um, items? You know, do you get stuff and you're like, oh, no, not one of those again. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and do you then, um, you know, are you in a position to feed back to some of those, you know, into those design processes? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, as you say, without giving too, too, too many, uh, you know, sensitivities away. I mean, we are mainly dealing, in terms of mobile phone, we're dealing in Apple and Samsung product. Uh, of which, you know, they are more repairable. I mean, that's what I was talking to, to John, my chief commercial officer earlier, and understanding actually, even in terms of the networks that phones are being locked to, you know, that used to be quite a barrier, actually, because people didn't quite understand, oh, can I buy a, 
use phone because is it going to be locked to the wrong network and I'm on Orange and they're on Vodafone or whatever. So actually having that flexibility of not being tied to a network. But I guess, you know, I mean, the the, the right to repair uh, element, you know, th there's been rumours a couple of times over the years, oh, the new iPhone that's going to come out, um, only, only I, uh, Apple will be able to repair the screen and, you know, people then object to the you know, the, the fairly sizable charge that Apple will make them to change the screen and, oh, it'll recognise if it's not an Apple original part and all that kind of thing. So, but those things have never transpired because I do think they realise that it's it's really important. And, and actually what, you know, in terms of the people who are acquiring refurbished product from us, um, they need to be able to uh, buy a starter phone, as it were. So, you know, our, our bottom phones, iPhone 6s and 7s, which are 6, 7, uh, seven and a half years old now um you know if you've got a child who's going to school as an example um 11 years old they're going to second school as we call it here high school um you know that's the point when a lot of parents want to get their children uh their first phone so actually if they can have one that costs them more like 100 pounds 150 pounds um that they can then kick around the playground rather than a brand new one that's really important so actually again if we can keep you know, and the manufacturer is now motivated because Apple's second biggest income stream is all that peripheral income from all the app income and the storage and, you know, all those other elements. And actually, it's a, you know, many, many years ago when I signed up for a student bank account, they gave me a record token. Uh, that was 32 years ago. I'm still with that bank now uh, because they sucked me in and I've now done everything in my life with them. If Apple can get a child signed up to them on an older phone, they're likely to stay in the Apple ecosystem for a lot. Well, it's difficult to change. We all know that. So I think the manufacturers do realise it's important actually to, to to try and make them, you know, accessible. Don't don't keep it as a closed club that you know only they can uh, repair things. Um, so you know, I do think you know, and, and again, we've talked about phones a lot there. It is the same for other uh, other items, whether it be wearables or consoles or tablets. It's exactly the same principles and giving that product second, third, fourth, fifth life is so important. And, uh, you know, I do think it's uh, it's as important for consumers as it is for the manufacturers. Can I ask Retha a question? Hmm? Can I ask a question of Retha? Please do. Yeah. What, what are the challenges that you face, um, you know, for repair? What are the big challenges? Uh, is our... Um, you know, are locked phones a big issue? Because I know Kenya, there are a lot of imported uh, products. Um, what, I'm just curious. What what do you what kinds of challenges are you facing when you when you get devices in um, and you have to decide whether it can be recycled or repaired? Yes. Um. So for repairs, uh, the ones that come to our center, we only strictly repair ICTs. That is the printers and laptops as well as computers. We do not really go into phones as much. Um, the challenges that we've faced so far for those ones is. Uh, if we do not find parts within whatever we have already collected, then we have to buy new ones, which then sort of increases a bit the cost to the consumer, but they don't mind anyway because it's still a refurbished computer. It's still much cheaper than what you would get new into the market. So that is one. Um, when it comes to phones, we realized that there are some people who would really love to have the secondhand phones or the used phones. So instead of doing it at the, at the center, because again, we, don't, we really don't want to go off the scope of recycling. We have trained over six, around 630 technicians across the country to be able to repair other types of waste before they can then be delivered to our center. So we, we, we have them in those different counties for them to do such kind of works before then we can have it for disposal. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm going to follow up with you later on that program. That's really tremendous. Okay, no problem. Yeah. yeah. That is a lot of people to have trained. <laughs> well done. Brilliant. <laughs> um, I wanted to, to ask a question as well about um, with the dismantling of e-waste for recycling, you know, once it's beyond repair and there's, you know, there's really nothing more that we can do other than take it apart and, you know, get the small pieces of copper and whatever else back into the you know recycling plants what process do you use for you know to to dismantle electronic equipment um i'll start with rita and then and then we'll go to steve because i imagine that there's going to be some differences but maybe yeah. i'll be surprised um i mean for the longest time we have been doing it manually 
um, just getting the equipment and people just going on a big dismantling table and, and screwing things and all that kind of stuff. But as time went on, we realized this is taking a lot of time and it's also really tiring for the technicians who are there. So we decided to uh, get some tools so that it's, it's sort of uh, like a hybrid system whereby we have things that are def that definitely have to be done manually, but then at the same time, we have tools that help to fasten the process. So these tools are, not, are uh, dismantling tools, but we also have some equipment that help us do the same. An example of an equipment is a CRT cutter. So instead of us trying to get like some big, big tool to be able to cut a CRT into two, we have a machine that does it in under a minute. So For our listeners, what's a CRT, please? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm assuming everybody understands that a CRT is a cathode ray tube. So the really big screens that have that had the big bum or the big behind before we could have the flat screens. Yeah. So for us to be able to recycle the different parts from it, we have to separate into different pieces, and we do that with a with a machine. Great. And then and then so is there any shredding that goes on? Because I kind of imagine that, you know, when you come to a certain point, um, you know, if you've got wires or that kind of thing, you know, how do you actually get the metal separated from the plastic? Yes, the reason for us to, in the first place, disassemble is so that we do not shred or crush everything together. You realize there's so many valuable items that are in the waste such that we have to separate and sort them into their different families for us to be able to deal with them according to those to those different families. So I'll give an example. It is not okay for us to crush a battery together with a cable because they each have different components which we can still extract it can, and they can still be useful elsewhere. So the only things that we crush really are things like plastics so that they are much easier to handle when, when they are in small pieces and the glass that we get from the waste and such kind of things. But the rest of the other items, we extract up to the last point that we can reach so that we make sure that that little piece of um, fraction is reused or it's recycled based on whatever family it's in. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Steve, does that, does, uh, are there many similarities with your approach at Music Magpie with dismantling items for recycling? Yeah, more, more than you might imagine, actually. Uh, so uh, I was, I, I've, I've sat here and listened to so much of what Rhett has had to say. It's so fascinating. But I mean, as I mentioned before, we're, we, we are very focused on giving as many products as we can a second life. And actually, what we're left with is a very small amount at the end of that. And I mentioned before, we will then harvest for parts. And we are, and frankly, we are doing that manually. Um, you know, we are taking it apart and taking out the different component parts. Uh, if there is any bits and pieces left at the end of it, we're not doing that then final, you know, last leg of the journey of, you know, what we actually extract in terms of the core uh, components of that product. And we, you know, obviously work with certified recycling partners who we do that, who we pass a certain amount, and it is a really small amount uh, left at, at the end of the day. So not dissimilar methods um, at all uh, to Retta. You know, we are actually just using and piecing things together uh, as, as much as we can and refurbishing them back to a, as good as new condition. And I'm, uh, just so before we do finish, I know we're under a bit of time, so I must say how important it is for corporates to get on this agenda. We talked today a lot about consumer behaviour and activity, you know, especially as now, you know, post-pandemic uh, businesses are coming back together physically more uh, again, you know, we, we've just started working with Deloitte in the UK where we're now servicing all their old device components. It's exactly the same principle. It's just a bigger quantity. They've got a box. They've got a room full of their old devices. You know, there's lots of IT recyclers out there, but, you know, not perhaps not so many device ones. So, you know, if anybody is sat there listening to this as a business, please do something with your old e-waste. You know, consumers are taking on this on more and more but it's a great thing to write about when the ESG qualities in your annual reports and to, and to feel like you're doing the right thing. And again, you can do something smart. You can raise some money. You can give it to charity like, you know, a lot of our part, corporate partners do. But this is a global thing we're trying to do across the world and across business and, and uh, consumers that we're trying to re-educate people with. So, you know, I'd really strongly encourage anybody to think about what they're doing at home and work.
Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Steve, for that for that message. I think it is a, a really important one um, and interesting as well. I know, Reti, you mentioned that you've been doing some work with with businesses and government um, agencies across Kenya as well. So um, good to see them getting engaged. Um, do you have much participation in collection schemes when it comes to businesses? Please come again on the collection. When um, so, if you approach corporates in Kenya to them to you know to 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 send in their old electronics to the we center to be repaired and 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 recycled and what have you um do you have very high take up you know do they participate much or is there still some warming up to do with that sector um as you find it we have we have businesses are different and they have different priorities so even for us on our end we have sort of categorized them so that we approach them differently. We have international businesses and high ranking businesses, which have a reputation to, pro to protect. So they even come to us, we don't even have to go to them asking us to properly dispose their waste. Then on the other hand, we have businesses that don't really give much priority to e-waste or sort of the data they have in their devices. So we have to have more of a push for them and maybe um, have like little treats to, to see that they, they dispose their waste properly. So yeah, we, we have to categorize them and deal with them according to their different priorities as they are. So the best to deal with definitely, I will say this for sure, are the international companies and the very high ranking companies because we have no issues with that. Um, then the sort of like the middle level, it's sort of like 50-50. There are those that you really have to push hard for them to understand and, and do trainings for, but there are those that you approach and they instantly release their waste. Then for the low lower ranking businesses, those ones are, uh, they're the ones that also inspired us to, to now branch into the hub to sort of like help them understand this is what is happening guys and you have to join, you have to wake up now. We don't have time as the, as the recent hashtag says. Yes, <laughs> yeah. excellent. That sounds brilliant. I'm definitely going to be looking at your website and seeing what innovations come out of that hub. Um, it's mm -hmm. certainly an exciting area to be working in, isn't it? Yeah. Great, um, Adam, any, any, uh, any points that you'd like to, uh, to pick up on there? Mute it again. I'm good at muting myself. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I know I'm just, uh, I re not really. I mean, I just, I'm really glad to be a part of this panel. And, you know, one thing I will add just to something Steve said, you know, one thing we're seeing in the US is more and more secondhand um, commerce, not just electronics. And, and we're seeing a shift to what I've been calling a used car model, um, which is, you know, if I buy a new car in the US, I always have the resale value in mind. Um, and, uh, you know, because at some point I'm going to sell it, somebody else is going to own it. And so I'm, I'm looking to buy as much car as I can with the idea that there's as much durability. And we're starting to see that happen um, in um, uh, better quality apparel in electronics. And it's a real shift in how people think about the things they buy. You know, five years ago, people were not buying their phones. They were not buying their IT in general with this idea of resale. But um, as, as Apple and others uh, start to get into the business and on the apparel side, as brands like Patagonia get into the business, all of a sudden you see people uh, buying things with the idea of durability in mind and resale in mind. And it's, it's a tremendous consumer shift. Um, uh, you know, used cars just used to be about cars and now it's starting to be about apparel and, and electronics. And I think that's very exciting. Um, and again, you know, circling back to COP26, I think it, it really is a good trend for a low carbon future. It's not going to solve everything, obviously, but it's, it's a very important component of what we're trying to accomplish. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I see Steve's added a message, uh, uh, comment. Well, well I did. I was, uh, for anybody not clicking on it, I just was just 100% uh, agree with Adam. I was pointing out the two biggest purchases a consumer ever makes are their home and their car. Yeah. And unless you buy a new build house or a brand new car, which I don't know the exact stats and I've made it up a bit uh, in the comment, but I'm going to stick with my 80% guesstimate uh, are used. So the yeah. two biggest purchases you'll ever make, and yet you, when you think about a phone or your clothes or you know, a musical instrument or whatever it might be, perhaps there's just still a little bit of a stigma about, oh, why do I do that? But 
you're quite prepared to go and sit in somebody else's car seat the day after they've owned it and indeed lie in somebody else's bath the day after you've bought somebody's house. So I don't know. I'm probably oversimplifying it. That's a really interesting perspective there. Absolutely valid. Um, and, and thank you, um, Adam, for circling back to COP26. I suppose um, you know, this is climate change is very much the, the theme of the moment or the year or the... Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's definitely in front of everyone's minds at the moment and quite rightly. And I think, um, you know, through our discussions at Waste Aid with, with people working with different kinds of waste streams and in different roles in the waste management sector, um, we, we, we seem to see that waste management is often considered as a vertical sector, whereas in fact it's very horizontal, isn't it? Because it provides the feedstock for so many industries and also decreases, therefore, the, the carbon impact of all of those various industries. And that benefit often doesn't get attributed directly to the waste management sector itself. Um, but it's certainly there, you know, in terms of um, the more that we can repair and refurbish, the fewer raw materials we're going to need, um, you know, the huge carbon impacts of, well, not just carbon impacts, but human and environmental impacts as well of mining. Um, so, you know, these huge lithium mines that we're seeing now and so on. Um, and then, you know, also keeping... Um, keeping equipment in good use and repairing it and Adam you wrote a really interesting piece recently on um, the repair of solar solar equipment so panels and batteries didn't you uh, which you know ties in another way with climate change there in, in in terms of enabling people to get renewable energy without the need for fossil fuels um, and that again is a very global trade isn't it with you know use solar panels uh, being traded with buyers in Africa can you just talk to us a little bit about that for a moment please I think probably Reta's probably got even more interesting things to say about use solar than I do, but uh, but it, it is an incredibly important market and it's a very growing, it's a growing market and at least uh, in the US, a lot of the people who are uh, entrepreneurs and pioneers in, in, the, uh, in the selling of used IT have now moved into solar. Um, mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is, is uh, these standalone um, solar installations, um, you know, are crucial in emerging markets to electrifying places that haven't been electrified. And nobody knows what the exact percentage is of, of new electricity going into these, these emerging markets that is coming from new solar. But, but if you speak to the various platforms that are selling new solar, I mean, you are, they're, they're, they have five, 10 million pieces of inventory on hand at any given time. And they're getting enormous orders from places like Kenya, Ghana, um, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, South Asia is a very, very important market for this kind of thing. Um, these are panels that may only be three to five years old, but they had a 20 year um, lifespan designed into them for various reasons. They're, they're being put into the waste stream um, and they're playing a crucial role in electrifying in a sustainable way, renewable way, uh, these countries. And at the same time, of course, they're preventing uh, at least uh, some of the manufacture of new panels. So it's a real market. Um, and I believe, um, you know, it's going to continue to be an important market uh, for the next decade, at least it's growing very rapidly. But I think Reda can probably speak much more to uh, what's going on with you solar uh, than I can, because uh, Kenya is a major, major market for it. Yes, yeah, I mean, over the past couple of years, we've had a lot of solar equipment being sold and they're only dying after like, uh, let's say from five to around 10 years of use. So uh, we did a, well, thank you for, for that question. It's a very interesting one. We did a study or a project last year uh, to sort of see what it's like to be in the whole um, solar, solar market. So we were able to collect waste and sort of see which, what, to what extent can this waste be recycled? What exactly is, in, is it this waste? Who are the biggest disposers of this waste and why is it being disposed? So we had a few findings, very interesting findings, by the way. The first one being that uh, solar waste currently is less than five is less than five percent of the total e-waste that is being produced, which was mind blowing for us because we thought, well, there's so much solar that is being used currently, so why is it only under five percent? But um, yeah, that was an interesting one. And then we also find found out that um, most of the people who are disposing their solar items, maybe let's say a solar lantern or a TV, is not necessarily because it's old or it's no longer working, you'll find maybe there's a battery cell that died or there's a cable that was cut and they don't know just what to do with it. 
and you find that the solar companies that had been introduced before did not have a program whereby they could take back whatever items belong to them to repair. But now after that study, of course, it's something that they're looking into to be able to take the old items, repair and send back to the user instead of disposing the entire thing. Because we found a lot of good items that have been disposed, but they were not at the end of life yet. Uh, so it, it, it was really interesting and I'm really glad that we had uh, an opportunity to carry out such, such a project. Yeah, that is really interesting. Steve, do you have any dealings with solar energy equipment or are you more? Uh, no, not yet, I will say. Well, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, you know, as a trade-in business of many, many years and having pivoted from physical media to consumer technology products and, and indeed expanded within that, you know, smart speakers, uh, won't be far away uh, for us, but uh, solar panels not yet, but we are looking at um, both uh, additional product categories uh, and territories um, that we can operate this uh, this model in, but uh, they're, they're to the future, you know, we're really, really focused on um, consumer tech, it's just such a huge and important um, market, um, you know, actually we're very focused on making it even easier for people to sell their old um, consumer tech. Uh, we have just launched uh, and announced actually we're rolling out 300 uh, smart drop kiosks within Asda in the UK, where people can sell their old mobile phone in two minutes in the foyer of their local Asda. So again, I mentioned before, it's uh, lazy man's eBay. If you still can't be bothered to sell your old phone to music magpie, well, perhaps you can if you're walking past uh, a kiosk in Asda and we can make it even easier for you to do so and you can pay for the, your shopping uh, that day. So actually what we do need to do though is keep ourselves really focused on doing what we're doing even better, even bigger. And as we said, if only 20% of people understand what e-waste is at the moment, we've got a very large audience of four times size, size that who you know, are leaving their product in drawers at the moment and don't understand uh, how uh, best to recycle it. So really focused on uh, getting that awareness generally up before we then start to expand the category. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And yeah, absolutely making things, making it convenient for, for not just consumers, but for all stakeholders to, to understand and participate in this e-waste recycling is absolutely critical. I think for um you know to, to preserve these very precious materials for a low carbon future. Um, I'm wary that we've gone a little bit over time. I'd just like to give each of you two minutes um as a as a final, you know, thank you so much. It's been a really, really interesting discussion, and I feel that we could go on for uh, you know for for quite some time yet. Um, but um we, we better wrap up. So um could I ask you just two minutes then, what would your message to world leaders be at COP26 about? e-waste. Um, Steve, I'm going to let you go first because I know you've got to dash off to another meeting, so thank you. I have, no, thank you. I mean, so I, I, I get all whimsical at this point. My dad uh, used to run the local post office in our village and he made a difference to the community and he cared about people. And I think, you know, that's very much how I was brought up and how we run this business. The core values of Music Magpie are that we care and we want to make a difference. And that's what everybody in any sort of position of power or autonomy, legislation setting should be very much in mind. I think, you know, I'm afraid I have got a problem and let's not go there about the political problems of the UK at the moment, but there's not enough of that goes on at the top level. They should be caring about this issue. You know, our prime minister is saying all the right things, uh, certainly in the last couple of days. Does he really mean it? Is he going to follow through with it? Does he care? And does he want to make a difference? And then actually take that responsibility on globally. We have to act now. The world has woken up to the importance of this. Consumers are waking up. Investors have woken up. Let's, let's wake up those at the very top to help us take us there. And if they need to step in, as we talked about before with legislation, please do so. But let's do this together. Let's raise the awareness of the damage that this product is is doing, this issue is doing. Very well said. Thank you, Steve. Um, that that's great. Um, if you if you need to get off, um, please do. Um, and I'll wrap up with with Rita and Adam here. Thank um, you. Thanks for hosting me. And uh, thanks so much. Adam, it was a pleasure to uh, meet you both. Fascinated to hear what you're doing. See you again soon.
Cheers. Thanks so much for giving us your time, Steve. Thank Cheers. You. All the best. Bye. Thank you. And thanks again for your sponsorship. Wait, Dave. Um, so, right, who would like to go next then? Retta, what, what would your messages to global leaders be at COP26? Uh, <laughs> this is a very touching one. It's very close to my heart. And I hope I don't sound angry for saying this. <laughs> But I, I think it's, it's, it's crucial for them to understand it's not all about trees. Environment is not all about trees. You find in oftentimes that every, um, every big discussion or every serious important meeting that is held by global leaders, it's always deforestation and let's plant more trees and let's invest in making sure there's more trees. I mean, come on, it's, it's, it's high time that people- and Everyone likes to plant trees, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not bad to plant trees. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a good thing to do. But at the same time, it's not only um, deforestation that is contributing to the global um, warming effects that we're currently facing. There's so many other things, such as e-waste, for example. We, we have uh, the black market burning copper cables to get copper from them. That is a big contributor a very big contributor, almost equivalent to you burning down trees. So why not also concentrate on, or rather involve other types of contributors and pump in some maybe investment or empower people who are passionate about those topics to be able to do more and uh, you know now add on to planting trees. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would say definitely just broaden and open our eyes and open our focus to much more than just planting trees. Mm, thank you. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we've been working really hard at Waste Day to get the issue of open burning oh, recognised by world leaders. Um, you know, I think the current estimates, and of course, it's it's very very difficult to measure because people are burning waste in all sorts of yeah. places and all sorts of materials. And you know, but we we do need an internationally agreed way to at least estimate those emissions yeah. so that governments can then include it in their nationally determined contributions and then attract climate finance to ultimately improve waste management you know of e-waste and all the other waste streams um that we, that we currently have to deal with and there's something like a billion tons of waste a year um going mismanaged so ending up on dump sites or being burned um just you know in the open and the climate impacts are absolutely um you know huge so but as ever waste is is not um a priority at cop 26 um we're hoping with cop 27 coming up in africa um that it, you know the the whichever country ends up being the the host next year we hope that they are going to um you know put waste management on the table I mean, if, if Waste Aid is lobbying for that and pushing for that, please, I, I will be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we'll work together on that one. And, um, and with the support of Adam as well, I'm sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just uh, my wrap up, uh, um, you know, world leaders, especially in the wake of um, COVID are very worried about economies. In fact, they won't say it at COP26, but they're more worried about economies than they are about climate at the moment. And then I guess we can all understand why. Um, you know, the message that I would like to send to global leaders in, in regards to, to e-waste is that this is a problem that employs people. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really exciting to me to hear Rena say that, you know, they've trained 600 repair techs. Um, you know, anywhere I travel in the world, you know, you know, here in the U.S. down to the local shopping mall, or if it's, you know, in Accra, um, there are new and more and more repair businesses out there. Repair is a growth industry. Um, you know, it sounds like such a minor thing to say in the midst of a climate crisis, but it's really important because uh, we really do need to prove to people if we want a solution to the climate crisis that you're not going to throw people out of work and stop economic activity. And that's what I think is so um, exciting about this growth in the repair, right to repair community and, and, and repair in general is that it is employing people. And, you know, insofar as we can encourage companies um, to design more repairable products, um, insofar as we can encourage consumers to think about buying secondhand, um, we're encouraging those 600 technicians, uh, you know, that Retta helped to uh, train. And I think that's, that's the message I would want to send, that this is, this is an area, a part of the climate crisis and the climate solution that employs people, and let's embrace it.
Absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And I think it comes down to, um, you know, the whole sort of looking looking at how can we deliver sustainable development? How can we deliver yeah. low carbon? But, you know, global population is increasing all the time. How can we do more with less? How can we be more resourceful? Mm -hmm. And the, the repair world is, is a classic example of that, isn't it? You know, there's great economic benefits, um, livelihood and training opportunities, keeping materials in the loop, you know, reducing the need for disposal costs and also ultimately reducing the need for raw materials and all of the environmental impacts that that has. So it's a, it's a, it's a win, win, win. And um, yeah, we are, we're absolutely going to keep pushing it and keep promoting it um, along with all, all other kinds of sustainable resource management through um, from COP26 through to COP27. So um, I hope to have many more conversations with both of you um, over the next 12 months. And let's see if we can get it on the table at COP27. What do you think? Absolutely. Great. OK, well, I think um, the time has come to wrap up. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And um, thank you so much, Adam and Rita and Steve in his absence uh, for being such brilliant panellists and bringing your very interesting uh, perspectives to our webinar today. Um, just to recap, all of our e-waste material is on the Waste Aid Hub at wasteaid.org forward slash e-waste. And we're going to be putting a recording of this webinar on there. Um, so you can watch it again if you'd like to. And also we have a um, waste and climate hub at wasteaid.org forward slash COP26, where you can um, read the views of Adam and hopefully Rita in, in the near future and, um, and lots of other different kinds of stakeholders and their different perspectives on the waste and climate links. So there you can find um, articles from you know, multinational packaging companies, from United, Na United Nations Clean, uh, Climate Change and Clean Air Coalition, and uh, many other different kinds of stakeholders. So please do log on, um, have a look and get in touch with us if you're interested in helping us raise the profile of waste management and recycling for a low carbon future. So thank you very much both once again, and um, I wish you all the best.